looks like folks are joining. We'll give everybody just a couple minutes here uh, to get in. All right, uh, a couple minutes in, looks like we've already got a great group. A uh, few people still joining, but let's go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us for the sixth event. It's been uh, pretty exciting. It's now so six months since we started the Meta Ledger webinar series. So thanks for those who've joined for some of the past events. Uh, today, we're really excited about a new type of webinar. Um, I think uh, COVID has prompted the need to innovate and think uh, differently about how we, how we do online events. So, uh, what we're calling it is the Meta Ledger Cafe. Uh, this will be a live discussion centered around blockchain, blockchain adoption in the life sciences industry, but uh, who knows where the discussion will go. Uh, quick, some guidelines for those um, who are already on. Uh, so everybody should be muted by default. Um, if you're not, I'll be sort of moderating and, and just making sure for the sake of the group overall. <coughs> uh, the way that we'll be structuring it, we have four audience poll questions, uh, not just the audience, panelists should also see the questions. And uh, those will be spread sort of evenly throughout the, uh, the webinar. Uh, and basically we'll be asking for opinions and get sort of consensus from the group on um, each question. And that will lead to discussion uh, Panelists, uh, which I'll introduce here in a moment, uh, we'll discuss, but also um, we very highly encourage audience participation. We have two mechanisms here. Um, so there is a raise your hand function. Uh, it should be at the bottom of the Zoom sort of screen. Uh, and I'll be paying attention to that. So uh, as you leave your hand, just leave your hand raised when you have a point or a question to bring up and I'll, um, there's a way I can unmute you and you can participate and, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can also ask a question in the Q&A tool um, and, and I'll go ahead and bring that into the discussion on your behalf um, if you'd prefer to do it that way. I think that's it. Um, so I'll, some quick introductions here. I'm gonna let the panel introduce themselves um, and uh, we're really excited to have a couple guests with us today. Uh, so go ahead and I guess, Matt, do you wanna get started? Yeah, sure. Um, as you've noted on your slide there, formerly McKesson. So until recently, I was emerging technologies lead at McKesson. Um, and as part of that role, I had the opportunity to track uh, blockchain technology in the healthcare space uh, for probably going back four or five years now, um, which actually gave me a front row seat and watching Chronicle evolve from very early days to what it is today. And it's, it's been quite the journey. So looking forward to today's chat. Excellent. Susan, go ahead. Um, yes, hello. Uh, Susan Loam with FFF Enterprises. I oversee the supply chain operations, including the uh, EDI between our trading partners. And uh, just as Matt mentioned, been involved with uh, Chronicled and blockchain and just very excited on uh, where the future uh, takes us. Excellent. Abby? Hello everyone, Abhishek Gudgatya. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Chronicle. Um, I run the product function at Chronicle amongst other things. Excellent, and Suzanne? Hi everyone, Suzanne. I'm CEO here at Chronicle. Really excited for um, a uh, broad discussion today, as Mike said. Really looking forward to your questions and hopefully some of you will raise your hand and join the conversation as well. Excellent. Um, and I'm Mike, um, head of marketing here at Chronicles, and I'll be moderating here today. 
Uh, so again, you can ask questions as well in the Zoom chat, uh, but would prefer if you can use the Q&A tool or raise your hands and I'll be uh, bringing questions in and also just making sure we um, move through the topics uh, at a good rate. So uh, this is a quick list of the topics today, the questions. Um, they will be multiple choice questions. You don't need to come up with your own answers if you don't want to, uh, although there will be options for that as well. Uh, so quick summary, uh, what might be standing in the way of blockchain adoption for enterprise companies in the life science industry? Uh, what are the most important criteria to consider in evaluating enterprise use cases for blockchain? Uh, what aspects of enterprise blockchain are still confusing slash unclear to you? And what life science is what life sciences use cases are most practical as a starting point for blockchain based solutions. Um, so I'll go through each of those again and uh, when the time comes. Um, but for right now, I just wanted to give you a, a heads up for what's coming down the pipeline so you have some time to think about it. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll um, and uh, X out of this as we don't need that and stop sharing my screen as this is a discussion. All right, uh, so if you all uh, see on your screen, you should have a poll that pops up here. What is standing in the way of blockchain adoption in the life sciences industry? Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and run through the questions just so are the answers that we have here. It should be multi-select so you can pick um, all the answers that you think are sort of uh, most important uh, in, in sort of the uh, standing in the way of blockchain adoption. Um, technology is unproven, um, waiting for first movers, others that are, you know, you want to see go ahead first and, and prove the value. Uh, maybe there is just doubt about the value in general, um, too long of a payback period to see ROI, existing trading partners that may not already be in the network uh, in the solution. Uh, there's uh, obviously debates uh, out there about public, private, hybrid blockchain and, and how that all uh, shapes up and, and maybe that needs more resolution. Um, lack of clarity, the open source versus closed source uh, debate. There's uh, definitely questions and thoughts around that out there. A heavy upfront investment uh, in integrations, resources required, lots of policies and processes sometimes may need to be changed um, and that can be a heavy burden up front. Um, and perhaps it's just competing initiatives, other priorities, COVID for example, I'm sure has created a lot of unique situations for companies. So that uh, can be a factor. If you do mark other, uh, this is where I would highly encourage you to use the chat um, and to submit uh, the any other sort of uh, ideas or reasons you think blockchain adoption might be going slower than you would expect. Um, and you feel free to, to um, send those ideas to the group at large. Let's see, and we've got about 90 participants. Uh, we're about halfway there with our responses. like an awkward silence <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah this will be i think uh future polls will be able to continue the discussion maybe while people are voting a bit looks like we're at about 60 responses i'll go ahead and give another 10 15 seconds here okay <laughs> uh, in the Q&A chat from Sunny Rocha, uh, <laughs> Matt leaving the Kesson is a core reason for <laughs> preventing blockchain adoption. <laughs> I certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sunny. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. Um, there will be other polls if you didn't have a chance to participate. So end poll, and then I will publish the results here so everyone can see them. Attendees, so hopefully everybody can see the results. Panelists, can you guys see the results? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can see yeah. it. <clears throat> I like that. Um, my suggestion won. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, because that's definitely something we've run into. Um, definitely when I was at McKesson, um, 
with COVID, but even pre-COVID, um, there are always competing initiatives um, around this. And so, you know, without being able to demonstrate pretty significant upfront value, um, it's very, very difficult to make uh, the business case around adopting the technology. Um, you've really got to be addressing a core business problem um, and it has to be aligned with business strategic initiatives as well. Um, particularly in the current climate, the business is reluctant to frankly pay for, but even engage in anything that's not aligned with strategic, strategic priorities of the company. Not sure if um, audience members can see the results here. I, I shared my screen just in case. Um, if anyone can confirm the chat. Island, Mike. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go ahead. I uh, know that was my two cents, so anyone else can jump in. Um, yeah, I think that and also the existing trading partners, um, I would say uh, it's exciting to see the companies that are innovating and um, establishing um, uh, nodes and, and running the testing. Um, and my hope is, I think maybe to answer your question, Matt, that that um, value proposition becomes increasingly clear. There's certainly a lot of potential between parties um, to uh, improve and drive efficiency that everyone wins at. Um, and I think as we can demonstrate that more and more, hopefully that will uh, motivate uh, companies to um, prioritize as well as uh, joint participation. Well, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? So until you have the adoption, you won't have the value. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot on the part of companies, but, you know, I, I agree with you, the value is potentially there um, if we can bring more folks to the table. Yeah. No, I completely uh, I, agree. Yeah, we have a comment from the audience. I'm going to let Sunny uh, go ahead and participate. Sunny, can you, are you able to speak here? Yeah, I think so. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, so I didn't want Suzanne to get the wrong message. It, I thought, I thought the question was what is kind of delaying or stalling and it, it, we're full force on to blockchain. I, we just kind of had, it kind of slowed down a little bit um, there for a little while when we had other resources take over, but we're back on track. I just wanted to know Matt was missed. Uh, appreciate it, Sunny. And it's good to hear you back on track. <laughs> Um, Susan, what are your thoughts on uh, what do you think is tough for companies? Well, you know, I, I've noticed the percentages kind of all align, and they really are, to your point, Suzanne and Matt, they, they go hand in hand. So you've got the conflicting priorities, but then you've also got the participation of trading partners, but you need that participation of trading partners to really visualize the value and the ROI. And so then you've also kind of got where you're waiting on your first movers of, I, I want to see that proof that it's working. Um, where do I prioritize within my other initiatives and who all is participating? And uh, I completely agree that as we continue to move forward and more trading partners um, participate, uh, we're really going to see that value uh, up front and continue to grow. Yeah, I'm curious if there's any companies on the call who'd love to sort of raise their hand and join the conversation. Would love to hear any specific feedback from, from people. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, it's, uh, it's a matter of um, what I believe is people understanding what um, solutions can do. Um, and exactly like you said, Susan, the, the pieces of value starting to show that will um, absolutely motivate others to, to join in. There is a comment, I think, uh, Kevin. Oh, sorry, Avi. No, go, go ahead with the audience comment. And then I, I was yeah. going to talk about the public versus private blockchain. It's interesting to see the percentage being so high, but we can get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's Kevin. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah cool. Perfect. Hey, Suzanne, it's Kevin Leininger from Integra Chain. How are you? Good, Kevin. Um, Thanks for joining. Oh, uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, yeah, I think I think one of the things I could encourage you guys to think a lot about, and, and Suzanne knows, the rest of you may not know me, but I'm a grizzled old veteran in life sciences. So I think one of the things to think about 
is how you kind of segment the life sciences market because the way Pfizer behaves is very different than the way Azi behaves, is very different than the way Paratech behaves, is very different than the way a pre-commercial pharma behaves, right? So I think one of the things you wanna think a lot about with respect to adoption is how Pfizer behaves is, is one way, how a pre-commercial pharma company or a small single brand you know, earlier, smaller company behaves is very different. And I think it's something, you know, you guys should consider when you think about go to market and how to get some adoption. You know, we found the pre-commercial guys, you know, we can sell stuff very, very quickly and they're very agile and they're very nimble. Try to sell something to, you know, Pfizer or Merck or AZ. It's just very, very different. So it's just something I thought, cause having run a lot of these webinars, I'm always looking for people to participate. I thought I'd at least raise my hand and try to add a little bit of thought there. So that's it. Thank you, Kevin. That's really valuable insight. And it's an interesting um, mix of, I would say, the smaller, nimbler companies. Um, and Susan, I'll put FFF a little bit in that category in terms of um, innovative capability and ability to move fast. But at the same time, I think some of the uh, interest in blockchain is actually quite deep at a lot of, a lot of the major life science players. They, they're looking to explore how um, this can benefit them. So there are sort of drivers on, on both sides, but super valuable feedback, Kevin, thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'll just- be, that. Oh, go I ahead, Matt, that, yeah. Uh, I think that was a really good point. And it's, it's one thing that we run into, you know, coming from McKesson, um, you know, it can be like turning a tanker <clears throat> around um, to, get, <laughs> to get things moving in a new direction. Um, but having said that, I think Suzanne's point is good that there is a lot of genuine interest. Um, from the larger entrenched players, um, which is really good to see. So. Yeah, Abi, before you speak to the, the public-private um, hybrid question, there's there's two points that the audience brought up that I thought might be relevant for you to, to consider. Um, one was a question in the Q&A tool, what, role, what is the role of the public cloud platforms that they can play in launching and running blockchain-based uh, solutions? Uh, and there was another point that different blockchains uh, don't communicate with each other uh, not communicating with each other might be a reason um, for blockchain adoption. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to add those in. Right. Yeah, those are those are interesting considerations as well. Uh, maybe to address the public versus private and I'm hybrid blockchain uh, debate that's been ongoing. Um, that's definitely an interesting one and has is something that we have engaged in as well over the years, and we continue to ask ourselves those questions. Um, in terms of the choice of blockchains, uh, blockchain technology that we've made. From the very beginning, at least Chronicle as a company, we've really focused on figuring out how to leverage blockchain technology to service our customers and to address problems, business problems that exist. Um, and to Matt's point earlier, the key really is to, to focus on key business problems which are uh, generating a lot of pain point and then addressing them using this novel technology rather than it being a technology driven project. So we've really focused on solving the problems and then figuring out what technology and what combination of technologies addresses that problem. And so to that extent, from very early on, we realized that public blockchains, at least for now, is not, a, uh, is not the way to go because it's not something that we can, it's not really custom made for the enterprise space and for our needs and for our customers' needs and for the needs of the specific business problem that we are trying to solve and also there are a lot of security issues and potentially cost variability as well with public blockchains. As you can see with Ethereum, the, there's a whole concept of gas prices and the gas prices fluctuate quite considerably um, on a daily basis. So we by design chose to go with a private blockchain that allowed us to really leverage, the, re leverage specific technologies to address our customers' problems and gave us a lot of flexibility as well. So for example, uh, earlier th this year, in fact, we, we were able to switch from using Ethereum, the Ethereum technology in, our, in, a, in a private blockchain to using Substrate because we figured that Substrate was a new piece of technology that, had, that really m made it super easy for us to cater to our customers' problems and to solve the specific business issues that we had at hand. So we've really focused on that. Um, and, and that's why we've chosen the private blockchain route. And we really believe that at least in the enterprise software space, that's the way to go for now and for the next few years there could very well be a future five to ten years from now when there might be merit in transitioning to public blockchains or pursuing a hybrid blockchain approach it, a lot of that is still 
is still to emerge. Um, it's too soon to tell. But for now, it's important for all of us collectively to focus on business issues and then solve them using the technology that's that's available. That's That's been our consistent point of view right since the beginning. Um, I don't know, Matt, if you have something to add to that. You've thought about that a lot. I have, and I've heard different opinions on it, obviously, from different folks, and Suzanne knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but just on that point, you know, you mentioned Substrate. And do you see a path to public from Substrate? I know that you know, mm -hmm. other folks have focused on Ethereum clients, um, so giving, because it enables a path to public. So. That's, thanks for asking that question, Matt. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons, in fact, why we chose Substrate, because Substrate has been built from the ground up, keeping the blockchain interoperability in mind, such yeah. that in the future, the blockchain that we have today, the network that we're establishing today could very trivially communicate with another blockchain out there that's either running on, on Substrate or running on another blockchain technology, be it public, be it private. So Substrate really allows for a lot of that flexibility and maneuverability. And that's one of the reasons as well why we chose Substrate. Got it. This is great. There's um, where questions are actually piling up, which is great to see all the participation and maybe we can uh, try to sort of incorporate them, but we do want to move on to the next topic here. I thought there was one other interesting um, other consideration to bring up that was brought up in the chat uh, that perhaps, um, you know, the, the, how proven the company is that's offering the solutions uh, could be a factor, you know, obviously SAP being a behemoth in the industry. Uh, some, uh, somebody companies are used to working with, uh, and so, you know, adoption of blockchain uh, may require working with smaller companies and startups, if you will. And uh, yeah, it's something to, interesting to think about. Actually, uh, Karu, thanks for the note. Nice to see you joining the webinar. Um, it's a really uh, valid point. I'd say I'm actually really um, uh, uh, hopeful because, uh, as we sort of talked about, there are a lot of companies exploring blockchain and a lot of companies that have um, spent time with Chronicled and have trusted us to build the solutions we're building. Ironically, um, SAP is one of our customers who's running our product verification solution for some of its customers. So our hope is um, partnerships with SAP can help maybe ease the way for some companies who maybe have those concerns. But at the same time, um, I'm excited to see um, really the industry being willing to innovate with um, smaller, newer companies like Chronicled. So, um, but it is valid and we certainly love to meet companies where they're at so that um, participation can be possible for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start the next poll here. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing this one and move to the next one and launch poll. So the question here, what are the most important criteria to consider in evaluating use enterprise use cases for blockchain? Uh, so minimal upfront costs and investments, uh, strategic business advantage, maybe against competitors or leverage in negotiations, uh, regulatory compliance benefits. Uh, obviously there's the Drug Supply Chain Security Act that's created a lot of interesting requirements in the industry where blockchain is applicable. Uh, and I'm sure there's others as well. Uh, the potential value that could be gained, the upside, if you will, um, minimal ongoing maintenance, IT resources required. Um, obviously, there's this is the architecture of a blockchain-based solution is a little different, and so there's uh, perhaps considerations there uh, than a traditional enterprise software solution. A short time to ROI. Uh, obviously, a lot of executives are under the gun to prove value and demonstrate, uh, you know, cost savings and things like that. Um, yeah, how easy the value is to understand blockchain technology can, uh, it's definitely new and can be somewhat uh, interesting to try to explain. And so there's, you know, how the use case can, be, how blockchain can be applied to the use case, I think, uh, and demonstrate value uh, is interesting there. And the ease of getting buy-in from trading partners, obviously you need uh, partners to be on the network in order to get value. And so um, getting the, the others to participate, uh, them being already you know, and ready and willing to participate, um, that can be a factor to consider as well. And again, if you do have any ideas on the other category, please post them in the chat. Um, there's a, it looks like by default, the chat is a message to all panelists. So if you click the drop down next to two, I think it should allow you to post to all panelists and attendees 
and that should allow everybody to see your point. Um, I, but let me know if that's not the case for attendees. This is Sunny. That's that's not the case. Um, it's not when, the case. Not for me. It says to okay. all panelists. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. All right. Well, I'll make sure those are mentioned so everyone um, hears them. Um, there's some neat questions in the Q and A uh, regarding. Yes, please. Uh, blockchain is it just sort of a neat use of newer technology um what i would say is we've talked about use cases and i'm excited to hear sort of the poll results in a couple minutes but um we've absolutely looked for use cases where there's um a benefit and i'll i'll pick uh, our product verification solution um it enables manufacturers to control the information directly about their products um, everyone else who's participating knows that only that manufacturer can control that item number information, but it allows from that item number um, wholesalers to upload um, an entire, if you could imagine, phone book of both products and um, IP addresses of where to reach information about those products. Um, and then it then enables a direct peer to peer message between that wholesaler and that manufacturer to get an answer back in less than a second. There's, there's elements there that that ability of the shared um, information about the products and yet at the same time manufacturers maintaining control, we do think is a very elegant solution that blockchain is very, very much merited. Um, similar on our chargeback solution, um, we've designed it that the um, databases that uh, contain uh, customer identifier information, HIBIC, HRSA, um, uh, DEA, that they can all be shared by the company so they know they're operating from the same data. And again, it enables the appropriate peer-to-peer -peer messaging between parties. Um, and again, this, this uh, direct peer-to-peer -peer and control of the information we viewed as sort of really important points that differentiate blockchain from other, I would say, um, uh, current standard information, standard technology that's available today. But I don't know, Matt or Susan, if you have other perspectives there, having looked at this. No, I agree. I was looking at the comment around comparing API communication, which mm -hmm. is you know, the point that you just made. Is that you know an API call is just a sort of send and forget. You don't really know um, how they're going to process the response on their end, and um, whereas blockchain is giving you a common, I guess, mutual copy of of the data. Um, as well as the um, smart contract business rule enforcement as well. Um, so it definitely goes leaps and bounds beyond API communication. Um, but I think you made some of the points in your, your response there, Suzanne. Thanks. Yeah, I have to agree with, uh, with Matt and, and Suzanne. Uh, you really kind of hit the nail on the head. It's, it's that same data, the, the real time, the shared communication, but it's, and as Matt said, you're not really you're not at a loss on what is what's being done with the data. How is it being brought in? It's it's all right there, and it's I just can't emphasize enough the the same data. Everyone speaking the same language. Everyone viewing the same information. Very beneficial. Excellent. Well, I think we've got about 65% of the polls for the next question here. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and publish the results. It's like strategic business advantage is the top choice. Interesting. Oh, I win again. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you then, Matt, with strategic business advantage, that's kind of a, a paradox because blockchain is in theory bringing competitors and trading partners together so that they all mutually benefit. Um, how do you yeah. differentiate that from strategic well, business? There are two different types, right? There are mutually beneficial um, and then there are differentiating products and services. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I view it is that blockchain gives you a platform on which you can potentially create new value add products and services to offer your customers. Um, so if you establish a network across the industry and you have a certain you know, level of adoption across the industry, that platform gives you the uh, feedback loops and, um, and you know, 
I forget, I'm forgetting the term that I'm looking for, but essentially it, it gives you a platform that enables rapid development of products on top of that. So you could potentially leverage that platform, um, network effects is what I was looking for, um, to come up with new business models um, and new product offerings. Um, but, you know, I think what I really meant there by strategic business advantage as well is um, that initiatives do need to align with uh, company strategy um, and company goals um, because in a lot of cases now we're not doing anything that's not mentioned in our corporate strategy so um, so then there needs to be a certain level of alignment there as well but... Susan what did you pick I actually agree with the strategic business advantage um, as well as the uh, regulatory compliance benefit from uh, the uh, sharing of information, the collaboration, um, when uh, a distributor sees red, the manufacturer sees red, and maybe red's not the right color, but you're, you're seeing the same information, you, you have that uh, mutual agreement, and it helps build that compliance where you're not talking apples to oranges. From the strategic business advantage, I agree with Matt, there is that mutual uh, advantage across all partners uh, through that collaboration and identical language uh, and real-time data feed. But then, as he said, and, he, and he's absolutely right, it gives you that platform to where trading partners can build upon it uh, through innovation of additional services. Yeah, and I think the regulatory one is an important one to call out. And Suzanne, you talked a bit about the product verification that was obviously driven by DSCSA, but it's kind of, when you think about incentives around doing something with blockchain, you know, you've got a carrot or a stick. <laughs> um, so either an ROI, a clear measured value, um, or a regulatory compliance issue. I mean, that's gonna force everyone's hands. So that could be a really powerful way to get things going uh, across the industry. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious if anyone um, in the audience would love to sort of chime in on their viewpoint. Would love to have them join. Um, yeah, it looks like Nitin, can you hear us? Nitin Mandalore? Yeah. Yes, I can. Perfect. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm actually more uh, inclined towards the ease of getting buy-in from trading partners. Uh, because what I understand that the blockchain is all about bringing uh, multiple parties uh, together and to make it successful, uh, we definitely need a buy-in, not just from one company, but from multiple parties. And uh, strategic business advantage, that was also one of my pick. Um, that I, my viewpoint was to uh, thinking from a company point of view that uh, how we can actually expand our businesses uh, having blockchain as our base. So a little bit more of that chicken and egg, Matt, that you talked about. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, maybe for folks listening today to maybe understand the potential strategic business advantage. And I think we're going to get to some questions about implementation, but I certainly think the experience of implementing, understanding the impact on your, your internal architecture, the value that it can provide, it's all really valuable thinking, sort of like I would say in parallel with the trading partners getting on board. That's certainly my hope for um, driving the, the cumulative value for the industry and that, and that participation. Um, but yeah, still takes, um, some courage and certainly the faster we can demonstrate or, or show ROI and value, then the easier it'll make companies to make that choice. Yeah, and a factor there too is on getting buy-in is the integration cost associated with it. Um, so, you know, a lot of companies might be reluctant to change their existing systems in any way, or um, they, you know, a lot of the entrenched players have a lot of legacy debt. Um, so a fundamental change to a business process has huge repercussions um, throughout and can be very expensive to implement and risky as well. Um, so if you can find ways to make that adoption implementation, I guess, um, fairly seamless to the business, then that helps with the whole buying question as well. 
Maybe, Wonderful. But, Thanks. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I just have maybe a bold question. Uh, Kevin, I would value your insight or others. Um, there's a lot of sort of um, disruption coming to healthcare. Um, this seems to me is an opportunity to, to figure out a, a role this can play. Does that weigh in in people's mind? Are they, are they worried about the bigger change? Or is it easier just to stay with the status quo? Uh, well, certainly, I'm sure others have uh, their opinion. It's Kevin, but uh, I, I would argue again that that it depends a little bit on who you're talking about within life sciences. You know, that it's just to to something I think it was Matt or somebody said earlier. It's so hard to turn, you know, a Pfizer, you know, or a very large pharma company. There's so much momentum behind the status quo. Uh, whereas you go to a smaller or mid-sized company or a pre-commercial company. They can do anything that makes sense to them much more quickly and nimbly. So, uh, you know, I think it depends a lot again on I we really bifurcate kind of big pharma. And by that, I mean, probably top 20, 25 pharmas and then kind of everybody else. And we think about them very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I would think that they their ability to to play the disruption. I mean, in fact, the smaller guys kind of by definition are driving a lot of that disruption. I, I would argue that part of the factor you have to consider for blockchain adoption is the price of the product, uh, because the price of the product is going to have a strong correlation between its distribution patterns, right? So, I mean, cell and gene therapies are not ongoing therapies; they're one-time therapies that might be administered in the hospital. So, how do you think about that product uh, versus, uh, you know, Plavix, right, or a normal small molecule retail product in the supply chain and how it moves around? It's completely different, right? And and my guess is the ROI for the blockchain is completely different from a uh, Beijing or an Amune or somebody like that or a cell and gene therapy company to uh, a retail products company. So uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Awesome, thanks Kevin. Yeah, thanks so much for, for weighing in there. Um, I wanna go ahead and move to the next poll. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing this one. Uh, and the next question is uh, about blockchain technology uh, specifically. What are the, what aspects of enterprise blockchain are still confusing uh, slash most unclear to you? Uh, and I think this will be an interesting uh, opportunity for clarification for many and, uh, and interesting to see which parts people still uh, find difficult. Um, so immutable record keeping, uh, the concept that nothing can be changed on the blockchain, uh, shared source of truth, meaning everybody in the network is looking at the same um, blockchain ledger uh, a trusted source of truth, meaning you know where all the data has come from. It's uh, everybody in the network has been either uh, verified or at least is following um, the same rules. And that sort of aligns with business rule enforcement as well. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the ability to enforce, you know, how data is shared or transactions are sent on the blockchain. Uh, and data privacy as well is uh, a factor and we can add clarity for that. And again, if there's any other aspect of blockchain that you find confusing, there's a couple questions waiting in the Q&A tool on this topic as well. So I'll make sure those are brought up. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing because I think everyone can see the poll when I publish it. So I think we can at least get a, you know, see everybody other the speakers more closely. Um, Karu raised another question about what's the risk of not adopting uh, blockchain? I think it's um, a, a great question. I think that's where at least our stance, and Avi, I'd love you to weigh in, comes from creating things that solve business problems. So I think the business benefit is what would be missing. Um, we don't think of it in terms of needing to adopt blockchain per se, but Avi, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree, Suzanne. I think the key is to, to realize that blockchain technology is is enabling solutions to problems in ways that were that that have never happened before older technologies just couldn't do that and that is bringing about a trend, tremendous amount of efficiencies in existing business processes and helping those who are choose to adopt the solution and adopt blockchain technology to really you know cut down on costs and as matt was saying earlier potentially offer new products and services to the to their existing customers improve partner experience, customer experience in a, in a fairly significant way. And I think those start to become competitive advantages very quickly over, over competitors. And that, that is in a nutshell, the key reason why 
some of these solutions need to be adopted and the technology itself needs to be adopted. Although I should say that even though what, again, as Chronicle, what we're doing today, we are focused on solving a very specific business problem or specific business problems, plural. Alongside that, what we are also creating the industry network and that industry network can be leveraged to start doing other business transactions and enable other business, business processes using the same exact network and the connections that are established between the trading partners. So there is that advantage as well that is accrued uh, should someone choose to adopt the technology and, and the solution today. And as with any other technologies, these at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, don't seem to amount to much, but the growth of the technology and adoption, the advantages start accruing so quickly and become so exponential that within a matter of a few years, you've suddenly, those who have adopted the technology have created these um, massive barriers, um, competitive barriers and competitive trenches vis-a-vis uh, -vis their competitors that can, that can prove to be quite significant and, and challenging for others to overcome. Uh, that so that's that I would say is why somebody should be really looking at this and look at look at it for sure um, in a very critical with a critical lens because it's not just chronicle there are others in the space as well and not all use cases warrant the use of blockchain technology so anyone evaluating the space and evaluating solutions should be looking at it through a very very critical lens uh, to evaluate the short term gains and the long term gains. I think there's also a FOMO factor, fear of missing out as well. <clears throat> when you've got a couple of your competitors doing it, um, incentive is much stronger <laughs> to participate. <laughs> and we're super fun to work with, hopefully. Well, that's true as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I just published the results for this question um, by a large margin business rule enforcement uh, and data privacy seem to be uh, the hot topics. Uh, so uh, yeah, anybody who wants to take those and I guess a, a, a brief high level explanation would be a good place to start, but uh, we can also get clarity on. Passing it to Avi. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. So business rule enforcement is really referring to the ability for us to encode any business rules that might exist between two or more trading partners on the blockchain. So an example, if we take the, an example, it'll be much more clear. If we take the con contracting and chargebacks use case as an example, where there is an upfront pricing contract that is established between the manufacturer, the wholesaler and the GPO, and the terms of those pricing contract are um, enforced when a claim is submitted by the wholesaler to the manufacturer. What happens today is that those uh, contract contractual terms and the rules around those are really on, on are they exist on paper and then from a system perspective they exist in the manufacturers systems that they use today the legacy systems and the wholesalers or the gpos may not have either the visibility or um, uh, necessarily buy in into what those rules are that the manufacturer is enforcing for a given pricing contract with blockchain you can take all those rules for the for chargebacks for claim adjudication uh, and put them on the blockchain. And then as soon as you put them on the blockchain, by definition, those rules cannot be modified by any party unilaterally. So the rules that now exist between the GPO and the manufacturer and the wholesaler can in theory be under the control of all three parties and the rules cannot be changed un until all three parties agree to the rule changes. And that brings about a lot of transparency and it distributes the responsibility across the board and gives everybody the guarantees and assurance that the rules will be enforced in a very standard agreed upon way and everything that's happening is happening very transparently quote unquote which i know is somewhat in conflict with the data privacy point which we'll get to and that's the beauty of some of the technologies that are being used today that you can achieve both you can achieve transparency at the same time achieve privacy and that's what business rule enforcement is really referring to uh, there. Just encoding, pure encoding of agreements on the blockchain, which is a Switzerland, if you will, uh, in the enterprise software space. I might add something there, Abby. So, you know, our experience with contracts and chargebacks was that we couldn't necessarily agree um, that the business rules would be identical across the trading partners. So. There is an element of, it's a kind of a hybrid model where you have 
common network level rules, um, but then you can have individual business rules, which you can think of more as like application layer rules that are configured um, at the different trading partners. Um, so it's kind of a combination of both, but, but you do need those network level rules, which need to be agreed upon, agreed upon across the network as well. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Right. Yeah. And actually for those um, curious, uh, we've had a lot of really rich discussions in the working groups we've held between um, GPOs, wholesalers and manufacturers with, I think everyone having this base desire, wouldn't it be great if the industry could agree? but also I think a pragmatic understanding that that's just not possible the way everyone does business. So I think exactly Matt, like you described, um, this doesn't mean you have to follow these rules and change the way you do business. I would say those network level rules really are pretty fundamental um, with the idea that it makes it approachable for everyone to participate, but that you can then customize rules that are between you and your direct trading partners to ensure that they're um, honored every time. There's an interesting question uh, that I think is relevant here today, in, especially in chargebacks, a lot of the rules are maintained in an application like Model N. Um, those, those rules, how are those placed in the blockchain incorporated into the process um, using blockchain? Well, I, I mean, it is uh, at the end of the day, those rules are business logic that is encoded. Um, it's in software and it happens to reside in a system that is um, that belongs to a specific trading partner, uh, in this case, the manufacturers, but of course the wholesalers have uh, corresponding systems on their end as well, where similar rules are encoded in software. And we are simply taking those rules and uh, encoding them in blockchain. Uh, blockchain allows you to take arbitrary pieces of code and uh, put them on the blockchain and such that those pieces of code cannot be changed without the agreement for uh, amongst all the parties involved in that piece of code. And the piece of code once activated on the blockchain, once encoded on the blockchain, then starts reacting to any future um, transactions that are submitted to it and can do what it has been asked to do. In this case, in the case of chargebacks, it's about claim adjudication, the rules are encoded. Of course, the, one of the key things is that these rules have to be agreed upon and encoded right up front um, before the network begins its journey, the rules can be modified later, but it's very important that all concerned parties come together to a table and, and which is a lot of work that we have done and agree on the rules before they're agree uh, before they're encoded on the blockchain. And also before they're encoded on, on the blockchain, the, the, the effectiveness and the outcomes of the rules are verified as well in a very formal thorough way so that everyone is assured that the blockchain is going to behave in a certain way and is going to adjudicate the claims in a certain way in, the, in this particular example. But otherwise, rules on the blockchain behave just like the rules behave in, in a, any typical software system. Abby, if I could add to that uh, real quick, just from an EDI perspective even, the limitation, while we have industry standards on the EDI that are somewhat like business rules, uh, they're still very stringent where uh, the business rules and coding for those, not only from a network, but then the flexibility of, so the hybrid model as Matt and Suzanne had spoke to, provides that uh, mutual agreement and uh, flexibility for future modification with agreement. At, and it also brings that awareness and transparency between the uh, variations between software systems on what the rules are. So for instance, what are the uh, rules within a Model N versus an SAP versus a Vistex? And even uh, within trading partners using Model N, there may be variations in those business rules company to company, uh, as Kevin mentioned, a lot of it based on size, where the uh, business rule enforcement and coding and blockchain, just to kind of paint a picture, has a, a broader ability um, through that logic and coding to not only enforce, but have visibility to and that awareness where with EDI, uh, it's extremely uh, stringent and, and is, it then in turn creates an, uh, a situation where it's open to interpretation based on the receiving uh, trading partner, especially with uh, claim adjudication. Completely agree, Susan, that's a, that's a great point. There is a lot of protocol development that's happening um, and that's, that's important to acknowledge as well. 
There are two questions uh, on a similar topic, which I think we can, can be addressed well. Um, the role of cloud technology, I think, and specifically cloud versus on-prem solutions in both ado get increasing adoption of blockchain and I guess, you know, better results long-term, you know, what are the impacts of choosing one over the other? I can, I mean, so the way that the Chronicle software is deployed, it's deployed as Docker images. So they can be implemented either on-prem or on cloud. Um, so each trading partner or each company has the opportunity to pick one or the other. So if you're favoring on-prem infrastructure, then, um, and you can stand up a Kubernetes cluster, then you're free to deploy on-prem. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, we elected to deploy on Google Cloud. Um, we'd also done Azure deployment deployments in the past, um, but it's really up to the individual company. So one of the beauties of this is that you're really just deploying independent nodes um, across a network. Um, and you know, each, each party has full discretion on, on how they do that. Um, having said that, there are, I saw a question there about um, PaaS versus on-prem as well, or software as a service. And there are cloud providers that provide, I guess, templates for blockchain networks um, or you know, SaaS style blockchain networks as well. Um, but they're going to have limited value. Um, a lot of the value attached to blockchain networks is what you build on top of it. Um, so yeah, you could look at those individually, um, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of the, the value sits in um, what's being built on top of the network. The, the one other thing I would, I would like to add there is um, the, the software itself can be self-hosted or hosted by a third party. And that's a choice that everyone in the network has as well. We have designed it, the software has been designed from a data privacy perspective, which I do want to get to right after this. But it has been designed keeping data privacy in mind first and foremost, and it has been designed such that everyone can choose to host it themselves and so that the data and everything is in their control. But if they would like for business reasons, if they would like, if a customer would like, they can give it to a third party to host it for them. And that's, and that, that's fine as well. You still become a part of the network and you still continue to transact and communicate with your trading partners in a peer to peer uh, manner. Uh, which so that's a nice segue into the data privacy comment because I know that's that's in the poll as well. Um, there are two ways in which data privacy is tackled, and you know, data privacy is one of the core tenets of blockchain technology or blockchain philosophies, I should say, that uh, that everyone is really uh, everyone really cherishes, and we as a company as well, data privacy and data is is at the core of what we do. And what, how we've achieved, is, achieved it is in two ways. One is, as Matt was saying earlier, to distinguish between the blockchain layer and a sort of what, it, what you could call a private layer, where a layer where your data resides, your private data resides in your firewall and is in your control, and you decide who you want to share the data with and under what conditions. And that gives you the complete guarantee that you're not going to end up sharing information that you don't want to share with people you don't want to share it with. So the, you have complete control over your data because the data resides in your firewall, with, behind your firewall and in your control. The second though, because I'm sure a lot of you are asking the question, well, if that's the case, how does that reconcile with the blockchain and the fact that there are certain transactions being sent to the blockchain and information being sent to the blockchain as well? As far as a lot of the transactions are concerned, for example, the claims, they are not sent to the blockchain in a raw form. They are sent to the blockchain using a second piece of technology called zero knowledge proof, which is which is an absolute uh, uh, you know cutting edge technology that uh, uh, very few in the world use today. And we are perhaps the second or the third company using it in a real solution. And it's a technology where you can really prove to somebody or, or, or prove to a system that you've done something or you have the answer to something without revealing the answer itself. So as an example, if you, if you think about a Sudoku puzzle, how do, how do I prove to you that I have the answer to the Sudoku puzzle without revealing the answer itself to you? And that's, the, the, there's this nice balance that zero knowledge proof uh, achieves where you prove something to someone without revealing the private information. And that's one of the other key pieces of technology that is being used to achieve data privacy, even though we are talking about blockchain, something that is shared, and that's open to everyone, we achieve data privacy even in that scenario. It's nice to hear you using an analogy other than the driver's license. 
Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have about a few minutes left here. Uh, perhaps the final poll can be sort of uh, done as a as a leaving point. And I'm also going to share my screen here, um, just so everyone's aware. The next webinar we're doing Tuesday, October 13th, uh, we'll be talking about the implementation of a live enterprise blockchain solution, um, probably focused on the contracts and chargeback solution. That is uh, one of our, uh, our main focus today, uh, but it should be very interesting. And, and I think a lot of the questions here today uh, spoke to how you actually get on board, how you, uh, what the implementation looks like, resources required. Um, and we have a number of coming through this today. And we'll talk a little bit about lessons learned there. Um, but I think we also have time to do a final poll here. Uh, leave on that note. I'm going to so I'm going to stop sharing this one and share the last one. This is just about the use cases that make the most sense. Um, so, what life science use cases are most practical as a starting point? Um, so again, this is sort of about the adoption of blockchain rather than the you know total potential value. Um, so, you know, track and trace may be sort of obvious and have a big opportunity there, but does it make sense as a starting point? Same thing, cold chain, um, which is more of an IoT based supply chain solution, obviously requiring uh, IoT and tracking of temperature uh, for pharmaceutical drugs. Drug pricing uh, is, a, is a big one, uh, and there's a lot of different implications there. Some of these categories may have subcategories, so please share in the chat if you have other ideas or thoughts around that. Um, master data uh, obviously gets fed uh, information out of their sources, and it can be a a big task for companies to maintain and manage that. Rebates and chargebacks along similar lines to drug pricing, uh, but specific processes in terms of uh, sending money between trading partners to facilitate tricing, uh, pricing uh, for different reasons. Uh, inventory visibility, and then obviously uh, clinical trials and R&D are, are pretty broad topics that are we're just sort of touching here uh, and have a lot of uh, underlying layers. Any final comments, words from our panelists? Uh, I was just gonna say, Kamesh just posed a question just as we're leaving while everyone's answering. Um, what kind of identity service does Chronicle follow? Key management, does Chronicle that off-chain strategy, how Meta Ledger manages the nodes? Maybe as a general comment, and Avi, please chime in. Uh, Meta Ledger solutions are run decentralized. The companies themselves run the nodes. Um, and they have uh, control and access of their private data. Chronicled doesn't even have access to your private data. So we, we offer uh, suggestions of how to do key management, but it really is up to the companies, but it also retains your sort of privacy and control over your data. Did I get that right, Abby? Mm -hmm. that's, that's spot on, Suzanne. And just maybe to add on the off-chain strategy, we do have that. I mean, uh, as we've been saying throughout this discussion, uh, Chronicle, the application that we built and the solution that, that we built cannot be called a blockchain only solution. It is a solution that uses blockchain and has a, a lot of code and data residing in, an, in a quote unquote off chain layer as well. And the two layers interact with each other very, very closely in order to, uh, in order to provide features and benefits to the end customers. So we definitely have a fairly significant off chain layer and a, and a strategy, if you will. Track and trace the winner. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are about out of time here. So I want to thank all of our panelists, Matt, Susan, thanks so much for joining. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see everybody else on uh, the 13th of October for our next event. Good. All right. Thank you, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.